welcome to our YouTube channel. We trust this message inspires you and encourages you. If you'd like to see the full service, click on the link below. Other than that, enjoy the message. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Unshakable Church. As you can see behind me, we are busy expanding the auditorium and it is an exciting season. So I just want to welcome you to, on, to this online service, this special online service. And if you're watching alone, if you're watching with your family or if you're watching in your connect group, welcome to every single person. If there is someone sitting next to you, why don't you give them a crisp high five? If you're watching alone, you can give yourself a high five. That's fine. And this is the Unshakable Church. And who are we and what, we're, what, what are we about? Well, it's about moving lives. That's what we are about. And that's what Jesus is about. He's in the business of moving lives. If Jesus had a business card, it would say moving lives. He wants to reach people and take them from where they are to where they need to be. And that's who we are. And that's what we're about. We want to move lives, move lives in our community, move lives of the people in the church and the people that will come to the church in the future. So how do we do that? Well, our core values give you an indication. We'd like every single person to love God love people, discover their purpose, and of course, empower change. And as we go through the spiritual, the spiritual journey, as we go through this eternal mindset, that's our goal for every single person, that it's not just um, uh, I am where I am and that's where I'm staying, but that we're actually moving forward and that we're growing. And that's the Jesus we serve. But before we get into today's message, let's take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. And we pray today as we receive this message that we can open our hearts to take it and not just leave it there, but let it drop from our head to our hearts and our hearts to our hands and that we would live out this message. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So recently I've been thinking a lot about my upbringing and the values that, that were taught to me and the, the habits that I formed and the routines that I have and the decisions I make today based on what I learned when I was younger. And you know, the more I think about it and the more I speak to people about it, the more I recognize that we have a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences. So for example, one of the similarities I noticed is that almost everyone with siblings has had a fight over the TV remote, a fight over what we're going to watch and when we're going to watch it. Some people even take it to the extremes of switching off the electricity so the other person can't watch, watch, watch the, the show that they want to watch. For some people, you didn't grow up with TV at all, so you had to get creative with, with other things to do. So as I said, there's similarities and there's differences. But one of the most fascinating similarities I find is that how similar people are in their characteristics based on the order that they were born in. So for example, I am an oldest child and I have certain characteristics to all the people there that are oldest children. So if you're oldest child, just raise your hand. And as oldest children, we're known to be the third parent. Some people would call us bossy. I call us responsible. We're not born bossy, but we're born responsible. It's, it's similar to the first pancake. Either the first pancake is perfect or it's a dud. I'm going to say that most, most, of, most of it is perfect. What if you're a middle child? Raise your hand if you're a middle child. The middle child almost always wants to be opposite to the first child. So this is the crazy, energetic, wild person. But this is, the middle child is often forgotten. Nobody really remembers their name. Nobody really worries about where they are. They're just kind of around and they so-and-so's brother or so-and-so's sister. This is the middle child. Raise your hand if you are the youngest child. Now, the youngest child we know is the favorite child. This is the spoiled child. This is the child that the parents kind of relax. They've been through parenting now. They're a little bit older now and they let a few things slide. So we know the youngest, the youngest children are always the favorites and always spoiled. Perhaps you're an only child. Raise your hand if you're an only child. This is like a super oldest child or just everything combined into one. It is like having a little adult in your house. It's interesting how there's different characteristics and maybe some of these things relate to, to you and the characteristics that you have. But I've just noticed these similarities. But you know, a, a family is made up of parents and siblings and aunties and uncles and grandparents and even family friends. You know, we're imperfect and we're flawed, but we're still family. Well, isn't this the picture of the church? Isn't this the picture of the unshakable church? Imperfect, flawed, but still family, still there, still, still unified, still connecting, still connected in some ways, even though we're different in other ways. That's the picture of the church. We, have, we relate to God as the Father. We have Jesus as the Son. We have church as the bride. You have the Holy Spirit as the helper. There's, there's a whole mix of, of, of different things, but we relate to each other as family. That's what the church is. 
The problem is, especially in recent times, there's an attack on the church. There's an attack on family. Because if you can divide family, if you can divide the church, you can divide values and morals. In the world we live in now, there, there are d- disagreements more than ever before on what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, what's wise and what, what's, what isn't. But if we go back to the church and the value of the church, we know that we can bring that back and we can stand on those foundations. That's what family is about. And that's what the church is about. And that's why over the next few moments, we're going to look at how we can build the unshakable church. We're going to, we are building the unshakable church. So let's go along this journey of how we can do that. If you Google the word church, you would get a suggestion of churches in your area, different denominations, different types of churches. If you went to images of churches, you would find church buildings. So what is the church? What is the church actually? Well, if you look at the Greek, it's ecclesia. And ecclesia has two meanings. It means an assembly, group or gathering of people called out for the purpose of worshiping God. So it's an assembly, a group of people that are called out to worship God. You've gotten together so that the purpose of that is to worship God. The second meaning is a meeting place, the house of the Lord. In other words, the unshakable church building. So it's not one or the other, it's both. The genius is in the end. It's assembly of people worshiping God and God's house. Isn't it incredible when you can see the unshakable church, a group of people getting together to worship God in God's house. That's what the unshakable church looks like. So what what does that look like for every one of us? Well, it's God's house, it's our home, and it's our responsibility. Isn't that family? Isn't that what family does? Isn't that what the church looks like? But as I said, there's been a mindset shift on what the church is and the value that it brings and the value that it holds. And I just want to chat about three mindset shifts that have happened over the last little while that we just need to remind ourselves of. The first one is, how can the church serve my needs rather than how can I serve the church? There's been a shift of what can the church offer me? What can the church give me? These are my needs. This is what I want. It's almost a me mentality rather than a we wiring. It's not about us. It's not about the church anymore. It's about me. There's been that shift of I want to be served rather than serve. Services are too long. Ah, I don't like this song. I don't like this person. Where's the other person? I hope they're giving away free stuff today. All of those are are thinking about ourselves more than thinking about how we can serve the church. So is it comfort, convenience that we're after? Or is it the cause, the cause of Christ, the cause of the church, the bride of Christ? Is that what we're after? Are we looking to be served or looking to serve? What value can I add? Can I encourage you, don't watch church. Don't let church happen around you, but get involved, get connected, get plugged in. We have, we have volunteers, we call them legends. Legends leave a legacy because they get involved, they contribute, they don't just consume. That's a mindset shift that we need to change. The second one, does church fit into my busy schedule rather than how can I schedule my life around church? Instead of thinking, wow, there's so many church events. I'm too busy to get to all of these. I hope the service isn't longer than an hour. I hope that I don't have to connect and talk to anyone that I can just get in and get out. My life is so busy. Well, everyone's busy. It's a question of priorities more than anything. If you don't prioritize church, I wonder if you prioritize Jesus. Just a challenge, just a question. Do we prioritize Jesus spending time with him every day if we can't prioritize attending a church service? What is our priority? You make time for what you value most. You make time for your family. You make time to not miss a flight, for example. You make time to watch the sports games that you will never miss. Do we make time to be part of church, to contribute to church. Everything you say yes to, you say no to something else. If we're saying yes to sleeping in, we're saying no to something else. If we're saying yes to attending one thing, we're saying no to something else. So the question is, what are we saying no to? What is that shift in our minds that needs to happen that I need to fit my schedule around church and around God? And the third shift that's happened, church is optional rather than church is a part of who I am. Traditionally, everyone goes to church. Not everyone, but traditionally, most people would go to church. It's a lifestyle. It's being part of a church. It's involved in a church. It's attending church. It's, it's, it's a lifestyle of who we are and what we do. But now it's kind of optional. Maybe I'll go this week. Maybe I'll go once a month. Maybe I'll go for Christmas and Easter. Then at least I've showed up. But it's, if we make it non-optional, if we say it's mandatory, that it's part of my life, this is who I am, 
then we'll prioritize it. We don't have to go to church, but we want to go to church. We want to be involved. The closer we are with Jesus, the closer we understand his heart for his church, his heart for his bride, that's the unshakable church. So we called out, we called out to worship God together. It's, it's a gather to go mentality that we're getting together. We, we're being equipped as the church to go out as the church and reach people. Remember, it's both the assembly of people, both the group of people, as well as the building that we're in. Look at it as a, a, a military hospital. That, you know, there's no time. We need to get equipped. We need to get ready. We need to get better. We need to heal so that we can go back into war. That's what church is about. It gets us ready. That's what building the unshakable church is about. God's house, our home, our responsibility. So what does God say? Well, if you look at Jude, which is the second last book of the Bible, we can see that he calls us out. He issues this warning. There's this urgency about what he's saying and what he's writing. And, and I reckon now more than ever before, it's, it's relevant to where we're at. Jude 1 verse 3, my dear friends, I really wanted to write you about God's saving power at work in our lives. This is what he wanted. This was his intention. But instead, I must write and ask you to defend the faith that God has once for all given to his people. So Jude wanted to write about God's grace and God's saving power. He wanted to write, but instead he has this urgency to write about defending the faith. Why? Why is that? Is that not relevant to where we're at? that we can talk about God's grace and it's important that we understand that, but there's an urgency to defend the faith. There's an urgency to defend his church. There's an urgency to build the unshakable church. Paul, uh, author of of two thirds of the New Testament, he writes to the Corinthian church and he reminds them of the importance of staying united as a church. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. Now, I love this because it speaks about the fact that there's not just one person building, but every one of us. We're working together. We're all putting on our hard hats. We're all putting on our safety gloves and our safety boots and we're getting involved. We're getting dirty. We, we're working together to build the unshakable church. It's fellow workers. We're in this together. It's about unity. It's about collaboration. It's about contribution. It's not just receiving, but it's serving. You are God's field, God's building. There he calls us God's church. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Now I love that he speaks about a foundation, but someone else is building on it. That there's always someone else. There's always someone else to reach, always someone else to pull in, always someone else to get involved. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that's so important that we we bring ourselves back to that. We recalibrate ourselves that Jesus is the foundation, that his word is the foundation. Everything we do, every step we take is about Jesus. And that's the foundation that we're building on. So you are God's building. You are God's church. And we're building this together. There's a Charles Spurgeon, the, the uh, English, English pastor in the 1800s. He says this, the day we find the perfect church, it becomes imperfect the moment we join it. Church is perfect until every one of us got involved. Then it became imperfect. There's no such thing as the perfect church. It is imperfect. And every one of us are on this spiritual journey of growing with God. That's what the church looks like. That's what family looks like. So let's rewind a little bit and look at where this all started. You know, Jesus lived 33 years, a perfect sinless life. He chose to sacrifice himself for every one of us. He then was crucified and three days later rose again. 40 days after that, he ascended into heaven and he gave us a mission. He gave us a commission to go out and move and reach people. But you know what? The Holy Spirit was already at work in the leaders of the early church. And there were 3,000 people that had made a decision to follow Jesus. And that was a sign of the early church, the church that had started with the Holy Spirit at work. This is the gift that God promised us. And in Acts, we see this picture of what the church looked like. And we can see some important principles, uh, what we can learn to build the unshakable church. And we see this in the pericope, which is the believers form a community. If you see headings in a Bible, that's what it is, a pericope. The believers form a community. Acts 2 verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including in the Lord's Supper and to prayer. There's just a snapshot of what the early church looks like. So what's the first thing we can see? All the believers devoted. So first of all, it's all of them. And the second thing is there's a devotion. So the first thing is hearts of devotion. What is devotion? 
Well, Webster explains it as this. The state of being devoted, addiction, eager inclination, strong attachment, love or affection, zeal, especially feelings toward God appropriately expressed by acts of worship, devoutness. Isn't that incredible, that description? Even, even using the word addiction, it's a devotion to God. It's this surrendering, it's this submission, it's this worshiping to God. That's a picture of the church. If we want to know what the unshakable church looks like, that's what it looks like. Devotion to what? Devotion to who? Well, we know it's devotion to God, but how do we do that? Well, the first thing is growing. What, what was the first thing they said? That they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So that's about growth. That's about every one of us being devoted to growth, devoted to growing, that we aren't staying in the same place, that we aren't going backwards, but that we're moving forwards, that we're growing. It's learning from God's word, that that's the foundation of where, we, where we're starting, where we're going. It's being challenged and encouraged. After a message, we should either feel ready to take on the world or feel that we need to change some things in our life. Almost like a spiritual slap. Sometimes that's exactly what we need. There needs to be encouragement and and challenging. And every one of us need that so that we can grow. Sometimes we need to be disciplined and sometimes we need to be encouraged. The second thing is they were devoted to gathering, devoted to getting together physically. So let's get together. Let's build relationships. If you're watching this together with a group of people, that's great because we are getting together. We are devoted to this word fellowship, which is actually just getting together. It's growing together, growing together with God at the center of it. That's the value of connect groups. And that's why we encourage people to join connect groups, building relationships. It's about communion. It's about sharing meals together, but also sharing the Lord's Supper together. That's why we receive communion every single month together as a church. Can I encourage you not to neglect that? Devotion to what else? Well, they were devoted to praying. They were connecting with each other, but they were also connecting with Jesus. This is your intimacy with Jesus. This is, this is you really having an attitude of, of wanting to grow with Jesus, of wanting to speak to Jesus. Every relationship requires effort, even the one with Jesus. And as we can carry on in verse 43, it says, There was a deep sense of awe that came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Isn't it incredible that while they were having this devotion to all these different things, that there was a deep sense of awe? That's beautiful. You know, we misuse the word awesome so much because awesome has just become just another adjective for whatever we want to explain. It's an awesome McDonald's burger. But if you look at the word awe, there's this this reverence. There's this reverence to God. It's almost like something that's completely come over us that we actually can't believe what's happening. They spoke about miraculous signs and wonders. That's why we celebrate testimonies. We celebrate life change. We celebrate miracles because that's what the church looks like. There's a quote by C.S. Lewis, the the author. He says, The perfect church service would be one where we were almost unaware of. Our attention would have been on God. That's what it all looks like. Almost to the point that we're so focused on God that we don't even realize what's happening around us. I wonder if we had a sense of awe. Would we be so worried about all the small things that are happening around us? Or would we be solely focused on God's hand in everything we do? As we continue in Acts uh, verse 44, And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Again, the picture of the unshakable church, right? So the point number three is that they are acts of generosity. They got together, they were unified together, but they also cared for people. They were generous, they had they had generous hearts. They met together, they shared together, they helped those that were in need. This is really about sharing our time, talents and treasure. Yes, we've spoken about serving and getting involved, but also we need to be obedient to God with our tithe. We need to be over and above that and be generous and be obedient. If we have a prompt to help someone, that we're obedient to what the Holy Spirit is telling us that we can be generous and we are a generous church. I love the fact that, that we, we, have, we, we have so many beneficiaries in Dare to Care that are so grateful for the generous hearts in this church, that there are people that have less than us that are able to have more because of hearts of generosity. That's what the church is about. That's who we are. And in verse 46, they worship together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared in meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. 
So that gives us a picture of point number four, which is lives of worship. You see, the early church had a lifestyle of praising God and worshiping God together. And that's what the unshakable church looks like. That's what building the unshakable church looks like. We can worship together. We can praise together. Praise is about really thanking God for what He's done in our lives. Worship is about how awesome He is, how incredible He is in our lives. That's why we worship together. That's why there's value in worship. That's why there's value in worshiping together. And it says that the Lord added to their fellowship daily. Remember, fellowship is just gathering together in God's name. And He added to their their, their number daily because there were other people getting involved. There were other people that were attracted to that. And that's why we're building church. And that's why we, we want to reach our community because there are people that are desperate for the touch of Jesus, desperate to know God. And they don't even know it, but that's why we exist. That's why we speak about moving lives, lives of worship, right? It's building the unshakable church. So remember, it's God's house, our home, our responsibility. So as we jump back to Jude again, we can see right at the end of his letter, he gives us this practical guide on what we can do. Remember, he issued us this warning. He says there's this attack on the church that we need to defend our faith. But what do we do? Well, he says there's a call to persevere. Jude 1 verse 20. Dear friends, keep building on the foundation of your most holy faith. That is building the unshakable church. It's about defending our faith, right? As the Holy Spirit helps you to pray and keep in step with God's love as you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to show you how kind He is by giving you eternal life. Be helpful to all who may have doubts. Rescue anyone who needs to be saved as you would rescue someone from a fire. Do you see the urgency that He has here? He says we need to keep building our faith. Don't stop. Don't settle. Don't just lay there, but we need to get up and build our faith. We need to pray. Trust the Holy Spirit is working through us. Pray every day, daily, two, three times a day. Make it part of our everyday life, you know. Stay close to Christ. He's saying we need to be with Him, that we need to follow His example. As He showed us how to live, we need to follow in that that we can rescue someone, that we can, we can help people who may have doubts. That's what this is about. It's about gathering to go. We're getting equipped to go and be the church. That's the picture of the unshakable church. It's an anonymous quote I just love to read. It says, though the church has many critics, it has no rivals. Although there's people that will judge the church and criticize the church, there's no rivals. We've read the book. We know what happens. We win. There is victory and there's victory for every one of us. So we know that although we are building the unshakable church, the church is already unshakable because of what God has done, because of what Jesus has done. So as we step into this, as we gather as a church to go as a church, as we as we build God's house, as we recognize that it's God's house, but it's our home and our responsibility and we all play our role in that. We can recognize that there is there is life to come from this, that there's so, something that is so much more to come from this. And imagine if every one of us took that mission, took that call to go out and do this. What would happen? We would build God's church. We would reach people. We would be influential in our communities, be influential in our businesses, in our schools, that we can reach people who don't know Jesus, that who desperately need Jesus, but don't even know that. It's about uplifting our nation. It's about being an example for others to follow. Imagine what could happen if every one of us that are watching this and listening to this would just take those steps of building the unshakable church. What what could that mean for for our world, for for our nation, for our community? That the unshakable church will be recognized as that and that we can give all glory to Jesus. That's building the unshakable church. That's about God's house, our home, our responsibility. As we do that, lives will definitely start to change. But perhaps you're watching this and you've never made that decision to commit your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never chosen to to fully say, all right, Jesus, I give my life to you. Well, let's recognize that Jesus lived a perfect life, 33 years, and He's God with skin on. He came here so that He could die for every one of us. That was His purpose. That was His intention to sacrifice Himself so that we could have relationship with Him. John 14, 6 says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. That means that there are different ways and different journeys and different routes that we can go on, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So how do I do that? How do I make that decision to commit myself to Jesus, to fully commit myself to Christ? Well, Matthew 7, 7 gives us an indication that we can ask, seek, and knock. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be answered unto you. And that as we do that, God's knocking at the, the, the heart, knocking on the doors of our hearts. 
and he's inviting us. He's, he, he's already extended the invitation. The question is, will we accept that? Will we say, yes, Lord, I commit myself fully to you? Can I encourage you, if you've never made that decision, or perhaps you have, but you've drifted away, to make that decision right now, wherever you're watching this, that you can choose to commit yourself fully to Christ. And if that is you, I, I want to encourage you to pray after me. Dear Lord, thank you for your love. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins and mistakes. I choose to commit myself fully to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, congratulations if you made a decision to follow Jesus today. Uh, we are celebrating with you. You are part of the family. You are part of this unshakable church. So it's an incredible journey. Can I encourage you, don't leave it there. Take your next steps. Check out the Bridge app. There will be a video at the end of this that will help explain some of those things as well. But I want to encourage you, fast forward is your next step. Get involved. Go onto the Bridge app. You can find all the prompts on there and that will be very helpful. But I want to encourage everyone, let's be the unshakable church. Let's gather together. Let's get equipped together to go and be the church. And remember, each week, each one, reach one. See you soon. What an incredible service. We truly hope that it helped. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus, congratulations, we're celebrating with you. We wanna encourage you to scan the QR code right now and we can help you on that journey, help you with that decision. What does that mean? What is your next step? We wanna encourage you, you only have one next step and that's fast forward. Fast forward is the on-ramp into church life. It will help you understand your decision, help you understand your next step, help you understand how to get integrated into church life. So sign up for fast forward. Once again, you can scan the QR code and we can get you connected through that as well but remember we say this each week each one reach one let's keep connecting let's keep reaching let's keep inviting and we will see you next time